distinguished journalist, Kim Dozier. Kim Dozier is an award-winning broadcast journalist. He spent 17 years with CBS. And for 14 years, she was a foreign correspondent working mostly in the Middle East. And between 2003 and 2006, uh, she spent most of her time covering the news from Baghdad. It was in Baghdad on Memorial Day 2006, while accompanying an American foot patrol, uh, that she was horribly wounded by a roadside bomb. That bomb killed four people. Thanks to a soldier who tied tourniquets on both of her, her shattered legs, and also to a team of military doctors, and nurses, and therapists who over the next nine months uh, worked with her. She not only survived, but she recovered. Today she runs 10K races without pain. And as she explains it, that's partly uh, to raise money for wounded war warrior charities that she champions, and also partly to show that she can do it. Kim has written a book about her experience titled Breathing Fire. I have a copy here. The excerpts of the book are in the handout that you received as you walked into the auditorium this morning. Uh, here you find a story of courage and perseverance. Uh, Kim is an inspiration for others who are struggling with the kind of wounds that she suffered. CBS didn't want to send her back into harm's way but Kim Dozier wants to go where the action is. And so she went to work for the Associated Press as a national security correspondent. And in this capacity, she returned to Iraq and also to Afghanistan. No wonder Dan Rather calls Kim Dozier a great reporter, and Tom Brokaw calls her one tough journalist. As a longtime editor, I have a special appreciation, as other longtime editors do, for a reporter like Kim Dozier, who will let nothing stand in the way of getting the story. This year, she is teaching with the title of General Omar N. Bradley uh, Chair uh, in Strategic Leadership, which is a joint appointment of the Army War College, of Dickinson College, and Penn State's Law School and School of International Affairs. And as if that job were not challenging enough, Kim is continuing her work as a journalist filing for CNN and for Daily Beast, and she's working on another book. We are honored to have her with us today. Now, I'd like to explain the format for this morning's uh, event. First, I'll ask Kim to come to the podium for a few minutes to talk uh, about her book uh, and about her career as a reporter and to read some to you. And then she'll sit down for a conversation uh, with our faculty moderator, Ann Koskowski, of the broadcast journalism faculty. And then we will go to you, the audience, for your questions. Uh, so please have your questions ready and use the microphones that you'll see at the front of each of the two aisles. After the program, Kim will be signing copies of her a book, Breathing Fire. Kim is donating her share of the proceeds for children in the Navy SEAL uh, community. Uh, the books are $18 each, and you can pay with cash or check. Or if you've already uh, contributed on the charity's website, that's NSW Kids, uh, you can show Kim your order and your receipt and get your signed copy. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Kim Dozier. Hey there, great to be with you and uh, to see a lot of faces I know who were here last night. So I'll expect some tough questions later from the journalist students in the crowd. I started writing this book because I was basically suckered into it by my counselors at Bethesda Naval Hospital as uh, the doctors were working to put my body back together after the 2006 car bomb. I had been a print journalist, but I'd never written a book before. Um, and yet, possibly because I was on a bunch of painkillers, I didn't think twice when one of my counselors said, 
oh, but you've got to write about your experiences because you're such a great writer. They hadn't read anything by me. Um, what they knew, though, is that for a trauma patient, one of the best things you can do to get over or process what you've just seen is to write about it as well as talking about it, which I did a lot. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what was definitely the worst day of my life, um, but I survived it. My colleagues, my best friends in the field did not. It was a CBS News crew covering a 4th Infantry Division team, uh, U.S. Army patrol, on Memorial Day. It was supposed to be what we call a dog and pony show. Um, they uh, take us out in the field and showed us, um, we thought, where an Iraqi um, group of troops was going to be taking over from U.S. security. But the first stop that they wanted to go to was where a roadside bomb had gone off and hit an Iraqi patrol the day before. The captain we were following, uh, James Alex Funkhauser, uh, said, we need to show presence. We need to show the Iraqis that this is what they need to do. We need to set the example for them to follow. We, we can't let them be scared off by these things. That's how we ended up on a dusty Iraqi residential street not realizing that we were walking into an ambush. So I'm going to read a little bit um, from the opening of my book and what it was like the night before a mission like this. Um, if anyone tells you that they're in a war zone covering conflict and they're not scared or weren't scared, um, A, don't believe them. B, if you go in the field with them, don't be anywhere near them. You want someone who feels fear because they know how to assess risk. So, chapter one, just before. The night before Memorial Day 2006. I hate these nights. Stare at the ceiling, turn left, turn right. Can't sleep. Dread tomorrow's assignment as usual. In the morning, adrenaline will pull me through as it always does. Tonight, Worry is getting the better of me, as it always does. The aircon is noisy and the thick hotel drapes of cheesy pseudo velvet block out the spotlights on the catty corner mosque nearby and the lights from across the river. The dra drapes are meant to catch any flying glass should a rocket hit the side of the building. But that's only ever happened once, so in my mind, that's not the problem. The problem is the next day's patrol. Sleep, damn you. Tossing and turning is a personal tradition I despise. It happens when I do embeds. I'll spend tomorrow morning with the U.S. Army Patrol. My two-man crew, my colleagues and friends, cameraman Paul and soundman James, will film the U.S. Army Patrol, and I'll trail behind them. The truth is, after three years as a latecomer network reporter, I'm still a newbie to the two of them, someone they put up with between assignments with the boys, such as news legend Dan Rather, with whom they've worked for years. For this shift, they're stuck with me, a workaholic news nerd. They've watched me climb my way from radio to affiliate to network TV. No matter what I think I am, to them, I'm the former wannabe who is still trying too hard. I'm also the only reporter I know who has family with a US military background. My father was a Marine in World War II, surviving the campaigns of Guam and Iwo Jima. That's probably why I went on assignment with the military a lot, which didn't always make me popular. Sometimes crews said no to my ideas. But to those of us involved right now, tomorrow's assignment makes perfect sense. There is no other place to be on Memorial Day in Iraq than with US troops. The three of us had done our pre-shoot security briefing this evening, not that I could provide much detail, the military press officer who had set up the embed couldn't tell our producers much over the phone, except that the patrol would take place in central Baghdad, so we could get back in time for the 7 a.m. Eastern Time live shot on the CBS Early Show, which airs at 3 p.m. local time in Iraq. You can't say much over the phone, because the insurgents are thought to be monitoring the phone lines. We don't know exactly where we're going or what we'll see, but the story has something to do with U.S. troops training Iraqis. 
Since tomorrow is a patriotic day, I suspect the story will be along the lines of, as they stand up, we stand down, the mantra of the U.S. commanders here. My crew and I suspect this will also be what we call a dog and pony show, something so sanitized for our cameras that it will be hard to get anything more than an Uncle Sam Knows Best commercial out of the troops. But we know that whatever we film will air on the morning show and almost certainly on the CBS Evening News. You can't not make air on a patriotic American holiday when you spend the day with U.S. troops. And Paul always said, don't risk my life unless we're going to make air. God, what a horrific way I kept that promise. We fast forward to Landstuhl Regional Medical Center in Germany. I have, at that point, woken up to find my family around me and a nurse named Nancy working on me. Um, I've skipped the part where I was conscious of the bomb scene. You'll have to read the book for that one. Or you can ask me later. Um, so I started becoming aware of the damage to my body. I had shrapnel to the brain. They'd done a craniotomy to, uh, that means they'd taken off this part of my skull, taken the shrapnel out and put the skull back on with rivets. Um, there, you can still feel them. That's fun. Uh, they had, um, put titanium rods in both legs. Both of my femurs were shattered. I had burns from my hips to my ankles, first to third degree burns. Um, and at the scene, my femoral artery had been cut. So I had lost more than half my blood. I was later told after I passed out at the scene, when I do remember talking to my rescuers, that um, I coded five times in the hospital. The doctor who came in to take off one of my legs I instead had to start doing chest compressions to bring me back. Thankfully, I don't remember that part. He did later complain to me when I met him um, at the uh, medical center down in Texas. He's like, you know, chest compressions are really hard. And I'm like, dude, thanks five times. So um, there I was in Landstuhl. I became aware of the countless other souvenirs left behind lodged in my body by the bomb. In my right hand and arms, I could see red and black flecks of shrapnel floating under the skin. In my x-rays, you could actually see some marble-sized chunks of molten car metal floating in my hip, a couple in my leg. There was even a small speck on the bridge of my nose and a couple tracing the outline of my right jaw. In Landstuhl, I wanted it out, all of it, immediately. The doctors explained that unless it was a large piece or located in a spot where it could do damage, most of it would stay right where it was. They told me it actually did more damage to dig around the soft tissues to remove it. My main nurse, Nancy Miller, brought in some of the chunks that doctors had removed from my leg. She'd gathered them in a large plastic bag and specimen cups. The first, a flat piece of metal twisted by the heat of the blast, which spilled over the sides of my hand, was recognizable as some sort of a car part. A second piece was a completely intact metal wheel weight from one of the tires, about the size of the top of a finger. I never even noticed that part of a car before. Every time I spot the wheel weight on a car now, I think of the one that was lodged somewhere in my thigh. What Nancy didn't explain was just how close I'd come to losing my right leg. I didn't learn that until months later. Doctors in Baghdad had relieved the pressure in my lower right leg with a fasciotomy when they'd sliced open the skin from knee to ankle down to the muscle in two foot long cuts on either side of my calf. But the blood circulation was still far from normal. The black color could mean my leg was bruised and still struggling to flush out the bad blood from so much damage. Or it could mean my circulation system had become irre irretrievably destroyed. So there was no way to oxygenate the leg's muscle tissues, tissues that might already be dying. My doctors were faced with a stark choice. They could gamble and hope what they were seeing was temporary bruising. But if the tissues were actually dying, that meant the doctors were giving the bacteria breeding in the dead tissue a chance to course through the rest of my body and kill me. Many doctors new to the field will take the more conservative course of action. They'll amputate the limb and save the patient. But my surgeons have been deployed in a war zone for about two-thirds of their year-long tour. Some of them more than that. They'd gambled before and won. Nancy explained that after some debate, they took a chance with me 
putting heating pads on my legs, changing them frequently to help stimulate the circulation. After about 36 hours, the gamble paid off. By the time I was awake enough to be aware of my legs and what had happened, the risk of amputation had mostly already passed. So, I skip ahead to the Naval Hospital, Bethesda Naval Hospital, which has now been renamed Walter Reed, because two hospitals combined. So my heart stopped twice. I asked Pete, my boyfriend, who told you that, he asked too quietly. That's when I realized my own family was keeping details from me. They'd been told I wasn't capable of handling it, and they believed it. So I was on my own, holding the line against the medicated, make it go away therapy, when a team of visiting psychiatrists came to my room to offer me drug therapy. I forgot you all had copies and were reading along with me. I should have told you where I jumped to. They wanted to discuss my options regarding which drugs might help and why. I was already on an old fashioned upper, amitriptyline, but not for mood treatment. Dr. Burns had explained that I was receiving a small dose, but not enough to have a mood lifting effect. He said the drug had a secondary benefit, alleviating nerve or neurologic pain throughout the body that comes from the breaks, the burns, the grafts, etc. But I thought even the little I was getting was enough. I didn't want anything else added to the chemical soup in my system. No psychotropic drugs, no antidepressants, I said, no Prozac nation nonsense. All it does is hide the pain, not treat it. That's not for me. But, but, was their reply, you should be aware of the options. I was resolute. I want to talk about how I'm feeling, why I'm feeling like bawling my eyes out, how freaked out I am about how my body's been shredded, how I feel about losing my friends, I told them. I don't want to cover it up. I asked them if I could talk to a counselor or join an injured troop support group where someone in the room would understand because we'd all gone through the same thing. Sorry, where everyone in the room would understand. The psychiatrist didn't reply. Maybe they thought I was avoiding the issue by avoiding drugs. Or perhaps there were no such support groups. Or maybe they are, but they thought an outsider, especially a reporter, would make it even harder for injured troops to open up. Well, one of them began, you might want to consider antidepressants for a short time. No, I said, and I meant it. Now I was going to have to explain. I told them I'd learned that talk therapy worked for me, helping me cope after being beaten, menaced, and threatened, both as a child and an adult in the Middle East. Then it helped me figure out my divorce and ultimately gave me the coping skills to survive the ever-present tension of living in Baghdad's red zone for three years without developing post-traumatic stress disorder. They eventually introduced me to two people. I talk about the Franciscan monk who was uh, great help and support, but also there was a naval uh, psychologist who came into the room and he's like, hey, so I hear you're the patient, they can't shut up. Good on you, I will talk to you, but you've gotta be aware of two things. I normally work with Marines, so I'm gonna swear a lot. Are you good with that? I'm like, yeah, I've been in the field with soldiers for three years, I'm fine. And I work with news crews. And he said, also, I can tell that um, you're going to talk a lot, and I'm going to have to shut you up and move you along. And I said, OK, it's like therapist boot camp. I can handle that. And we talked, and in about four, four weeks, the flashbacks, the hypervigilance, and the nightmares all went away. Survivor's grief uh, and guilt stayed with me for a long time, but the other stuff went. So I want to skip to the last thing I'll read from Postscript 2011, for those of you following along. Since I've written the book, the first edition in 2008, much has changed. I did not go back to the Middle East for CBS News. The CBS approved op-ed below, first published in the Washington Post, explains why. The op-ed led to a fantastic new job covering intelligence and counterterrorism for the Associated Press. I've been back to Afghanistan and Pakistan to report since then, including embedding with U.S. and Afghan forces. My mother passed away in 2009. My dad is still with us. Pete returned to New Zealand to be with his kids, and our lives took different directions. Our friendship will always remain 
cemented by the time he helped pull me through hell. And I didn't write here, and also deal with my parents in the hospital. That's another story. I not only walk without a limp, I run. I try to pay it forward, which is why my profits from this paperback will go to wounded warrior charities, like those that helped my family in our time of need. I try to keep putting my head down and pushing through to be a positive example for others coping with the same thing. There are flashes of anger in the original book that will produce knowing nods from other patients. I left them in, though now the anger is gone and I'm on to the next chapter in my life. One thing I know, I'm not a victim. That's what anyone is called when he or she suffers major trauma, assault victim, car crash victim, Baghdad car bomb victim. But victims have no independence. Family, friends, and colleagues, all with goodwill, coddle you. They tend to you when you first need it, but they don't know how or when to let you out of your cotton-cushioned cocoon. What I found is that it's harder to prove you're not a victim than it is to recover. Thanks in part to the media coverage meant to help troops, I fear we've taught the US public to pity more than respect those who return from war zones. You have to teach those around you that when the victim overcomes the trauma, learning from it, changing from it, and moving beyond it, she becomes a survivor, physically, mentally, and spiritually. I survived. This book is a survivor's tale, like so many who've come back, and we keep writing it. And thank you for listening to it. Okay. Taking a moment to turn on the right microphone. Yes, can everybody hear us okay? I know you can hear me. I would like to... Told you we're jinxed. Okay. I'd like to start asking Kim some questions and then... can keep on our schedule. My microphone is coming in and her out. And how is my viewing? Can working? you hear her? Is it working at all? No. <gasps> uh, play with the wire. Mine, mine's my wire. Take well, it off. There. Hold on. How about that? Talk. Testing? There. It's your wire. And yeah. Okay. So, Miss Kim, can you talk a little bit about being an embedded journalist and sure. how you handle that on a daily okay. basis? All right. So, you had two choices in the field of how to get to a story. Um, you could go out by yourself as a TV journalist. Um, that meant a large footprint. Uh, cameraman, sound man, producer, translator. That meant two cars, two drivers, and two security people. Everyone saw you coming. So while you used to be able to do that early on in the war, before journalists and everybody who was foreign became a kidnapping target in Iraq, um, you used to be able to spend significant time in a marketplace or someone's home. As it got more dangerous, as Al-Qaeda's presence grew, and even criminal gangs would seek to kidnap foreigners to sell them to the highest bidder, usually Al-Qaeda, uh, we had to limit our time on the ground. And our, our view of Baghdad and Iraq started getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I used to be able to drive from Baghdad to Mosul or to Crete. Um, you couldn't do that anymore. So increasingly, the only way to get to the story was to, or, I mean, you could do it, but you were taking your life into your hands, and it took vice presidents back at the head office to sign off on some of those trips, and they would often say no. Um, or sometimes your crews would say no. So um, going out with US troops was a way to access the story. But you always had to know you were only really getting the American side of the story. They did try to control, in some cases, what we saw. It depended on the commander, the unit, the troops. It was better a few years in after I knew some of these people personally. They've done multiple deployments, and they'd gone back home and seen my reporting on TV and then come back to the field again. And they would give me more free reign. Um, didn't always produce stories that they liked. Uh, but one of the harder things is once you get to know people, there, I, there's something that I saw go on, the maturation of a military journalist is what I called it. When we all started covering the war in 2000, 
three, the majority of us didn't cover the Pentagon, didn't cover the US military, um, and we were learning from scratch. And there was also a lot of inbuilt hostility on both sides. The troops thought that we were out to get them. We thought they were trying to hide everything from us. Then you'd go out and embed with them. They'd get to know each other. Um, and you'd, as a jur journalist, become part of the cool club. You'd know how to get in and out of a Humvee or on and off a Black Hawk, the right way to wear your flak jacket. And then, invariably, what would happen is somebody some media outlet would report something that happened at a unit you knew or were with. Um, some bit of either abuse of an Iraqi prisoner or uh, some sort of uh, policy, some sort of error. And you have to ask yourself, did I miss this because I'd let them become my friends? And uh, you'd move onward from being, you know, a cheerleader to, okay, I've got to be as hard on the military as it is on itself. Because that's the other thing you got to know once you really got to know um, the officer corps and the NCO corps, the non-commissioned officer corps, was they held themselves to a very high standard. And it's your job as a representative of the American public to hold them to that high standard as well. Okay. Um, the other, other question I have is, Can you talk a little bit about how dangerous it is in now, in this day and age, in military, in the field, uh, for reporters as compared to back in the Vietnam conflict? Well, I would say in Vietnam, when journalists could travel with the troops um, with great freedom for much of the conflict, it was as dangerous as that for them as it was for U.S. troops. Um, but they weren't specifically being targeted. With the rise of Al-Qaeda um, and the rise of the Internet, Increasingly, the militants, the rebels, whoever they are, they used to want reporters to tell their story out in the West or, or to whoever their uh, chosen market was that they were trying to reach. Now they can reach their followers through the web. They don't need us to broadcast their message or to translate it. Um, so instead, we become useful symbols to kidnap. It started with Danny Pearl of the Wall Street Journal in Pakistan. I don't know if uh, many of you remember, because um, you would have been much younger when he was, um, some of the students in the room, when he was kidnapped and beheaded. But that was one of the first journalists to be um, executed that way by Al Qaeda. And, you know, I was in Pakistan, same time, I had done the same exact thing uh, within a month of Danny getting kidnapped. Uh, because you, had a fixer, in this case, a fixer arranged an interview for him so that he could talk to some militant types, and they kidnapped him. Right. We'd all done the same thing. Right. Does anybody have any questions yet? Okay, so, go can you come up to the microphone? Yeah. Hey. Can you talk about the um, most difficult part of your recovery process? So, in the hospital, the most difficult part was the, the marathon of multi-trauma. Um, every time I turned around, you know, we'd fix one problem and there was another to fix. Um, they were able to save my legs with large grafts. Um, but then my body got something called Acinetobacter, which is a multi-drug resistant bacteria. So they had to flood my body with uh, something called colistin. It's the granddaddy of um, vancomycin and the other medicines that are out now. It's basically like pouring chlorine on your kidneys. Um, they hadn't been able to do tests on it, so they said, we think you gotta stay on it for six weeks. That seems to work. Well, at three weeks, my kidneys were tanking. And I had different groups of doctors in my hospital room arguing their point. The kidney specialists were saying, you've um, gotta stay on this medicine and we'll put you on dialysis. You'll, you'll lose your kidneys, but we'll sign you up for replacement. I'm like, great, keep my legs, lose my kidneys. Um, I, I chose to listen to another set of doctors who came into my room um, who said, well, your body might be strong enough to fight it off by itself by now. We just don't know. So I took the chance. And um, the other part was learning to walk again. 
and then finally, because uh, well, you don't realize when you're lying on the, um, when you're lying down for so long, your heart gets used to pumping your blood this way. And when you stand up, it's actually a lot harder for it to pump the blood all the way up to the brain. And I didn't realize that, and I stood up, and I stood up for too long and um, fainted. Luckily, my physiotherapist caught me. It, there were just many, many humbling moments like that. Um, the tough part about post-recovery was proving that I was physically fine and still having everyone from my loved ones to my colleagues to strangers in supermarkets just make assumptions about my mental health. Um, they saw me as a walking PTSD time bomb. I, I had someone in the cereal aisle of Wegmans tell me, oh, how are the nightmares? Oh my God. I tried to be gracious. I don't have nightmares. I had them for the first four to six weeks. I don't have post-traumatic stress disorder. And this person looked at me knowingly and said, ah, well, you will. <sighs> really? <laughs> um, and they'd never deployed to a war zone or been outside of the United States. Uh, but they'd watched it on NCIS, so they were sure. <laughs> so that was some of the toughest parts. Any, Any other questions? questions? So the question is, um, did this change the way I cover conflict stories and assess risks in the field? You know, um, I think I was always careful about assessing risks, though I have to say there was a certain amount of relief when I was no longer, when you're a television correspondent, you are assessing the risks for a team of people um, and knowing that you're the only one who's going to get your face on the air. So um, it's really got to be worth it for the story that you're going to get. And then you also have to have the influence with your head office to make sure it's going to get on air. Once I was back in the field as an AP writer, the relief was that I only had to make that risk assessment for myself. Um, and I did feel a lot of fear, just like I always did, you know, the night before going out to do anything. And you always hate every time you leave any military base in an armored vehicle. Um, it's, it's, it's the skin standing up, you know, the hairs are standing up on the back of your neck until you get back inside the wire. But it's also convinced me of the need to keep finding ways to, telling, to tell these stories. Because if you're not going to take the risk to be out there, uh, look what's happening in Syria right now. The um, militants, all the combatants, have targeted journalists in such a way that now no Western journalists are trying to get in there. And the story of Syrian civilians isn't being told. So that's, that's the painful part of watching what's going on right now. You know, we can get YouTube video out of there, filmed by uh, locals who are going through it, but they are invested in the story. So where is that dispassionate, um, objective observer who's going to bring you the story um, without uh, some sort of opinion or point of view? Any other questions? Come on down. I feel like the price is right. <laughs> yes, no. I have no cards. My question is, do international journalists uh, read the work of other international journalists in the war setting? And if so, do they interact and talk to each other about what do they see? I remember being in London in 2003, and journalists there were very critical of American media. So I'm very curious to see what it's like in a war zone. There's a lot of different agendas, a lot of different outcomes. Well, the, the TV people tend to hang out together because we all need to cluster near satellite dishes. And the print people tend to hang out in the same hotels together. But yeah, there does, there gets to be a group after a while of people who are, you're reading each other's work. And you are, um, you're as much reporting for your colleagues as you are for the American public. And your colleagues are your harshest critics. So it, 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 the great thing about that is it becomes an accountability check and balance. 
I, some of the issues in journalism in the past, as, as many of the journalism students will know in this room, um, Stephen Glass, Jason Blair, uh, journalists who were caught lying about stories, they were caught by other journalists trying to either match or check their stories. So it is really good to have that international group in the field. The other important thing that's happened is, um, you know, governments used to be able to tell two stories, one to their domestic audience and one to the international audience. Pakistan has done that um, for years with its nuclear weapons program. As international news media has proliferated and everyone can see the AP wire on their smartphone app anywhere in the world, it's gotten harder and harder for a government to lie to its own people. It also means the US government has had to learn. I, I've heard this lecture in, in military circles a few times. You can't message a local population anymore. You can't tell them something fake uh, because the New York Times or AP representative in that capital will fact check it with the New York Times or AP reporter back at the White House or the Pentagon and you'll look like a liar. Mm. So that's a positive thing. I think it's, it's as necessary to go in and um, find a way to tell those stories as it is for intelligence operatives to go in and try to find out what's going on to drive U.S. strategy and policy. The American public and the international public can't make decisions on who to vote for or what policy to favor if they don't know the ground truth. Um, and, and the only way really to get that ground truth is to have objective observers on the ground. Now what happens right now in a situation like um, uh, in Syria, you rely on second and third hand reports and then you try to get a bunch of second and third hand reports to corroborate each other. Uh, but it, it just, it's, it's like being blindfolded, the proverbial being blindfolded person trying to figure out is this an elephant or a rhinoceros? You know, and you've got like a hold of the tail and the foot. Anybody else? Come on down. Please line up at the microphones if you have a question, and we're pressed for time. We're trying to keep to your class schedule so you don't blow off the next class. <laughs> All right, cool. This one works. Um, yeah. In the postscript, you wrote, thanks in part to the media coverage meant to help the troops. I fear we've taught the US public to pity more than respect those who return from war zones. But that was written in 2011, and I'm wondering if your opinion has changed on how the media covers troops nowadays. What I meant by that is the media, including me, I did some of these stories, tried to tell the story of troops who come back either injured physically or um, injured in their head and hearts and how they weren't getting help and how it wasn't getting recognized. But what often happens, especially on network TV, is you go for the sob story. And especially some of these people who are asking for help felt like victims. And, and that is the message that we were sending out. And you combine that with some of the violent incidents where you have um, veterans who are genuinely troubled, who then commit acts of violence against their loved ones or the public. And it just adds to this overall impression of, um, you know, I'm not gonna use the expression bad apples, as, as Caitlin said last night, it's a weak phrase, but a few people who are really struggling, the, the less than 10%, the 5% of the population, uh, that becomes, the public sees the rest of the force through the lens of those people. And uh, I think we're still having trouble with that. I, I still talk to people on a regular basis who are serving or diplomats who've returned from war zones who are really sick of the pity. Uh, and I think it's one of the things that's keeping veterans from being hired because instead of respecting the wisdom and resilience they've gotten, the majority of them have gotten from the experience, um, people fear them. And that's, that's gotta change. And that, that's partly why I'm, I'm working on a new book on resiliency in special operations and intelligence officers, trying to capture some of those 
tough but ultimately triumphant stories. And then um, I'll sucker the American public into reading a book about spies and special operators and SEALs and stuff. And hopefully that'll make them see, you know, help add to this new narrative that has to be built. Yeah. Uh, I would definitely go back to Iraq. I, I wouldn't have changed that. Of course, you know, would we have changed that day? Sure. Um, now, in terms of being a combat correspondent, I set out to be a foreign correspondent. Crisis and war happened, but I don't consider myself a war correspondent, and I don't like the term, because it, oh, it, makes, it makes us sound like we're so important. And we're not. We are there covering something, bringing the international public's attention to something on behalf of people who can't get the word out. And you know, we, we all generally have passports. We choose to go there and we can leave. It's the people who are living through the crises, those are the ones who, are, uh, who I have the greatest respect for. And, and that's what keeps me going back to telling these stories. I, I'll, just, I'll just tell one story, there was, um, a group of Kosovo refugees who were fleeing um, the Serbs, and this was during the Kosovo bombing campaign. And they'd come out of Kosovo on a train into a refugee area in Macedonia where all the reporters who'd been kicked out of Kosovo were sitting there with their cameras. And we watched um, the Macedonian guards uh, stop them, chain up the train, uh, we actually, it was a CBS News crew who chased this train a couple of miles and filmed this. Um, they chained the train with people screaming inside and they sent the train back into Kosovo. That image was so reminiscent of the Holocaust. It was seen in capitals around the globe and resulted in amazing international pressure on Macedonia that Macedonia finally opened its borders and allowed refugee camps to be built for the fleeing Kosovars. So that's journalism at its best. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Does anybody have one? Okay, then I do. Yes. Uh, we encourage our students to become what we call multimedia journalists, meaning that you guys have experience, hopefully, in all the different medium. Um, but, and you ended up, you didn't start out that way, but you ended up through um, CBS, and then the AP, and then now the Daily Beast. You are a multimedia journalist. Do you have some advice for them? Yeah, I wanted to be a newspaper journalist. That's all I wanted to do when I started out. And I ended up writing for a newsletter and then going to Cairo, Egypt with that bit of newsletter background and then getting hired by a bunch of places. But in Cairo, I quickly found out that, with, especially with the newspapers and their budget shrinking, mm -hmm. a story paid, um, writing a story paid 200 bucks. Adding a photograph got me another 200 bucks. Going and doing the interviews for one story and turning it into a newspaper article and photograph and then doing a radio version of it for three different radio stations, that got me, oh, upwards of five to seven hundred dollars once I'd added everything all together. So economics drove me. Once I became a staff reporter, um, though, at CBS and at other places, BBC, it was all the same. Every single place expected you to be able to jump across mediums. You had to, if you were a newspaper reporter now and you want your profile to be high, everyone on the Daily Beast is expected to do television Q&A. Um, that's how I ended up being a CNN analyst because I did so much Q&A for CNN that they hired me. Um, so anyone out there, if you're ignoring one of the classes and saying, no, no, I'm a broadcast journalist or no, no, I'm a print journalist, oh, I'm here to tell you. <laughs> the reality out there is going to bring you up short. Study it all. This is your, you want to make your mistakes here because they put me on network TV way too early before I'd figured out the whole hair and makeup thing. <laughs> there are some MAC lipstick colors that live in infamy somewhere on the web <laughs> that I could not get out of the heads of the people that I worked for. And it took a while for them to see network potential in me because they remembered those, 
those early years. Right. So do it all here, make the mistakes here, become a pro here, and then take on the world. Thank you. Um, one last question. Uh, you say not to thank military uh, personnel for their service. Can ah, you explain that really okay. quick before we thank you for your service? Okay, so uh, one of the things that the General Omar Bradley Chair is supposed to do is to foster military civilian relations. So I'll translate this one and military folks in the audience can tell me if I have it right. Um, the phrase, thank you for your service, sounds to them like a, a, a pat kiss off um, to a lot of folks. So yes, say thank you, but keep the conversation going. Hey, so you served? Thank you for doing that while I was back here. Where were you? Gosh, how long were you away from your kids? Are you still in? Are you going to go back again? Use it as a way to get to know somebody in service, not just to say, hey, yeah, uh, have a nice day. Right. Keep the conversation going, and you'll learn about a lot of really cool people. OK. Well, thank you for your service. And I'd like to remind everybody as we wrap up that um, Kim is staying around for and to sell these books. Her proceeds from these books go to the Wounded Warrior, wounded warrior yeah. Charities. Sorry. Well, yeah, Charities for the Combat Injured. Right. Um, 